Okay, our next extremely entertaining and informative video is going to be on understanding the buyer and the seller temporary lease. Okay, so when is this addendum used? Well, when the buyer has an executed contract and wishes to move into a property prior to closing, they would attach this with the offer before it's an executed contract if the property was vacant or about to be vacant or it could be executed after the contract is in place. So either one. Now, this was going to take some communication between buyer and seller's agents to see if this would even be entertained by the seller and uh, if it would be applicable. So there's pros and cons to using this. All right? One is the pro for a seller is that he has income based on what he would or potential income, depending on how the uh, temporary lease is structured on what he would charge buyer for tenancy. The other side of the coin is, well, what happens if the buyer can't close? A seller might have to evict the tenant or continue leasing to them. You have to keep in mind that when this addendum is put into place, you know, a buyer most likely is going to move bag and baggage, furniture, etc., into the property. And if he finds out that he can't close, it's not going to be an easy deal for him to move on. So it might not be as quick as uh, possible um, if the deal for the, the sale of the house falls through. So um, both those type of leases, the buyer temporary lease and the seller temporary lease, are only good for 90 days. You cannot structure them for more than that uh, period of time. Uh, frankly, I don't think anyone in their right mind would want to use them for that long a period of time uh, because if you're going to sell the house, you, I don't think you'd want to wait 90 days, but it's a possibility. Anyway, no longer than 90 days. So let's take a look at the form, the buyer's temporary residential lease, right? Obviously, the parties are the landlord who is uh, the current owner of the property and the tenant who's going to be the potential buyer. Uh, paragraph two defines the property address and paragraph three states when the buyer will become a tenant and also states that this lease ends on the contract closing date. Paragraph four talks about uh, the amount of rent that would be charged on a daily basis. Okay. So the daily rental amount obviously is negotiable, could be zero if both parties agree, uh, but typically it would be, you know, what the seller is absorbing on a daily basis, especially if he has the property um, mortgaged. Now, the second sentence indicates that the buyer tenant shall pay the full amount of the rent up front when the form is executed. So. The seller will have uh, all the money in hand prior to the start of the uh, buyer's uh, tenancy. The third sentence in the, uh, indicates that uh, if closing is earlier than expected, okay, or delayed, the daily rental amount in the first sentence will be used to either charge the buyer at closing or issue a credit for the time that is unused. Uh, make sure that the title company is aware of any plus or minus and it is reflected on the closing statement. Paragraph 5 indicates if the owner is going to charge a security deposit or not to the buyer. Now, due to the fact that the lease monies are paid up front, as stated in the previous paragraph, there is uh, little potential charges that seller may be responsible for but a deposit could be appropriate if the tenant doesn't close and stays over or if there are unpaid utility bills. So it's probably wise to have some kind of a deposit in place. Deposit is refunded at closing if all goes according to contract and there's no offsets against it. Okay. Paragraph six identifies who is responsible for which utilities, connections and bills. Paragraph seven states that the property is for residential use only, okay, and the buyer slash tenant 
cannot sublet the property. Paragraph eight may or, uh, paragraph eight may or may not allow pets on the promise, premises, and it'd be identified in that blank space. Paragraph nine states that the tenant accepts the property as is, but the owner has the right to do repairs that might have been required by the contract. If the buyer tenant cannot close on time or wants to terminate the lease, they must surrender the property in its present condition. Paragraph 10 does not allow the tenant to modify the property in any way without the written consent of the landlord owner. If the tenant does so, it becomes part of the property. Fifteen is fairly self-explanatory. It just indemnifies the landlord for any claims from injury um, that might happen while the buyer is a tenant in the property. Paragraph 16 states that uh, each party should have proper insurance for the property and its context. Uh, who carries which insurance would be determined by whether the property is vacant and empty when the buyer moves in or if they are renting. So if the property is vacant, right? The buyer moves in they would have you would want them to have contents insurance in other words just like a regular uh, lease you'd want them to have show you insurance that their uh, contents were um, they had renters insurance and their contents were insured as opposed to the owner seller would have insurance on the actual dwelling itself you know fire damage that type of thing so Paragraph 17 gives the tenant 24 hour notice to comply with the notice of non-performance or a tenant will be in default. So if any provision of the lease, let's say that all of a sudden there was pets were not allowed and you wind up noticing that there's a herd of dogs at the property. So that would be a violation of the uh, agreement and you could give them 24 hours to cure or uh, notice uh, notify them that they're in default and they would have to uh, leave paragraph 18 the lease terminates upon closing and funding or the termination of the contract or the tenants default whichever happens first the tenant has then has to surrender the property to owner there would be a holdover amount the holdover amount should be significant because reality is that once this comes into play it means that the tenant um, has not been able to close okay um, and the seller is assessing let's say a penalty and that penalty should be fairly substantial so that uh, a tenant would uh, not stay past the termination date. Uh, I would say it should be like a couple of hundred dollars per day, right? And then, and again, that's going to accumulate and be taken out of the security deposit, uh, and that's why it's important to charge one as well. So, paragraph 20, self-explanatory, talks about who's going to pay attorney fees if there's a lawsuit. Uh, 21 and 22 allow the owner to bypass having to install smoke alarms or security devices, which you can't do on a standard lease. If you were leasing a property under uh, standard lease forms, uh, that would be uh, owner responsibility to have smoke alarms and security, certain security devices. Well, with a uh, temporary lease that's less than 90 days, they're not required to do that. Uh, paragraph 23, again, is self-explanatory. So read and heed. Now, the seller's temporary residential lease. All right? Many of the provisions of the seller's temporary lease are the same or similar to the buyer's temporary lease. But in this case, the seller is staying over after closing and becomes the tenant. And the buyer is now the landlord because he owns the home. Now, the difference here is that in the buyer's temporary lease, they're 
you're giving the buyer an opportunity to have a place to stay before closing, where in this case, in the seller's temporary residential lease, you're allowing the seller to stay typically for a few more days so that they can pack and move out. Um, I think it's wise for a seller to have that because uh, if they we see too many cases where the seller has packed up uh, and moved on and all of a sudden they find out you know that the house didn't close or it's not going to close all their stuff is on a truck somewhere headed to their next location so you probably want to make pretty sure that closing and funding has happened uh, and then give yourself adequate time to pack up and leave Okay, paragraph three states that the lease begins the day of closing and funding and terminates either on a specific date or X days after. So you can use that box uh, in that paragraph is kind of a free form in paragraph three. So you can put in there three days after, you can put in there September 25th, 2019, something along that line, okay? Now, it's also very important that you specify a time that the tenant will leave, 6 p.m., midnight, etc. something along, the, so you don't cause conflicts with the new owner wanting to get into the property while the tenant is moving out. This is very important. We see this all the time where uh, you have, the, you know, the, the new owner chomping at the bit to get into the property, Right, and he's stepping all over the seller who has the legal right to stay in the property based on the seller's temporary residential lease. It causes a lot of angst and a lot of phone calls back and forth between agents, uh, parties that are unhappy with each other. So make sure that it is uh, specifically stated when that uh, the seller or the now the uh, tenant is going to be leaving the property and what time. Paragraph four indicates that the rent per day, um, except for the closing funding day, all right, the, the, this le the amount that's charged starts the day after closing, okay? And it talks about the rent per day with the total amount to be paid at funding. So you wanna make sure that the title company uh, knows uh, the amount and uh, when you go and check the closing statement, make sure that's part of it and that the new owner is given uh, the monies uh, at closing. Okay, uh, there is no refunds for early leaving. Okay, so if, if they write it for six days to give the uh, seller an opportunity to pack up and leave and he only uses four, well, too bad. Uh, the new owner gets to keep that additional two days rental. Okay, paragraph 10 talks about alterations and it says that the tenant may not alter the property or install improvements or fixtures without written consent uh, of the landlord, okay? Um, it's slightly different from the previous form because the, the other form omitted, uh, uh, well, it had contained language that would not allow the tenant, uh, which at that case was the buyer, uh, not allowing them to make holes or nails in the walls, floors, etc. Uh, so this, it doesn't pertain in this situation, so it's left out of paragraph 10. Paragraph 11 to 13 as the same as the previous form, right? And paragraph 14 has one word different in repairs and maintenance, which is replacing. Now, the reason that's left out is because uh, the seller is uh, the one who is the tenant now. Uh, there's nothing that is really going to be required for him to replace other than what had been done prior to closing for any repairs. Now, one of the things you want to be careful is that both parties agree to what the seller will leave behind. Now, there are things that you would not ordinarily think of, but they become major catastrophes later on. Flower pots, for one, right? Uh, the a person who looked at the property saw all these beautiful flower pots in the backyard or on the patio, and then when they come to uh, live in the property or move in, guess what those flower pots are gone and you know they were never mentioned in any contract or any non-realty addendum etc but there was a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of what the seller was going to leave behind so be crystal clear on that to avoid any potential problems termination the lease terminates upon expiration of the term specified in paragraph three or tenant's default under this lease. Uh, 
So that paragraph differs from the buyer's temporary lease and that the termination date is the date specified in paragraph three or if tenant defaults on some other provision in the lease. Now, trying to get them out is another story. Think of the scenario. Uh, you're selling your house, okay? Uh, and you needed three or four days to move in. Uh, I mean, to move out, pack up and move out. And all of a sudden you find out that, hey, the house that you're moving into isn't going to be ready yet or the deal fell through or the builder's not ready or something along that line and you say uh oh well i guess i'll just stay over a few days uh, well you're really not allowed to and you are defaulting on uh, on the lease now paragraph 19 to 24 they're exactly the same as we talked about earlier in the other form uh, remember this lease is normally used to allow a seller a few days to pack and move out after they are sure of closing and funding. And that's a major reason why people want to stay over. They want to make sure that they have the money in hand uh, after funding all right, to, uh, to stay. Now, there's another issue that you need to be aware of, and that issue is closing and funding. A lot of times when they go to closing, uh, uh, the agents make the big mistake of giving the buyer the keys, all right? And guess what happens? The seller's in there for a temporary lease or he needs a few days to pack up and the buyer's, you know, got the key, opening up the door and starts to move his stuff in, okay? It's closing and funding, all right? Now, they're entitled to a key, all right, but not until the place has been closed and funded. So don't be so quick to give your buyer a key to get in the property. And if you do, make sure they're fully aware that the, uh, the seller who is now a tenant, has full rights to that property and should not be disturbed. He has uh, quiet enjoyment, so uh, they should not be moving things in while they're moving things out unless the party agrees to uh, work with them on that. 